Hi. I am delighted to be here with you this morning and want to thank Chief Wright for giving us the chance to talk to you about a very important topic, one that, as you know, since the start of the year, we've had some higher numbers um, and uh, going to present some information to you, give you lots of takeaways. I'm actually going to be talking in terms of the suicidal mind and give you some information about how a person actually becomes suicidal. I think you can't do good prevention or intervention or postvention unless a person actually understands the, the suicidal mind. So I'm going to give you some information about that. And the focus of the lecture, however, is on postvention. It's a term that some people are not familiar with. It is a component of the three components of suicide prevention. And you will leave here again with a whole lot of information. Now, when I, was, when I started lecturing for the Air Force about 10 years ago, we didn't do much lecturing on postvention. And we weren't making a lot of headway on postvention, but we are now. And joining me today is Lieutenant Colonel Madison to give you information on trend data as well as the progress that we're making on postvention as we move forward. So I want to spend a little time talking about defining the challenge. Why is this a challenge for chiefs? Because you're going to have to keep the conversation going about suicide. This is not a topic, as you know, that's going to go away. But how are you going to be engaging enough to keep that topic going so that people understand it's something that we do need to keep at the forefront and think about in terms of taking better care of people? And then again, helping you understand the mind and then the postvention. So there's a three-pronged process to, pro to suicide prevention. We've done pretty good on prevention. We've done pretty good on intervention. We need to get better on the postvention, and we really are. Now, the idea of postvention, which I'll define in just a moment, is that if you do good postvention work after a suicide, it actually becomes very good prevention work. So it's important that we get the postvention side of it, remembering again that there are three prongs to it. And I think for the most part, what we did is we got very heavily involved in prevention because when the numbers started to rise several years ago, we needed to get involved in intervention actually first. Then we took a step back and caught our breath and got very involved in prevention. And now again, we're moving forward on postvention. So what is this thing I talk about when I say postvention? It is the things that leaders will do following a suicide that will help make the difference in rebuilding a community following a tragedy of such, a, of such, a, such sort. So there are three actual components to three goals for effective postvention. This isn't just willy-nilly off, you know, off the cuff. There are actually primary goals that will make postvention more effective. The first is promoting healing. Promoting healing among those in the community that are suffering because of the loss of an airman. The second is to reduce the risk of contagion. And what is contagion? You've probably heard the word, but let me explain. A contagion is a fact that many people, or many, well, many people in the audience or in a squadron or in a unit might have depression, might have anxiety, and might be thinking about suicide. And so the contagion effect is not that you're going to put the idea in someone's head, but that the ideas are already there. And they may act on their own ideas about suicide following another suicide that they saw occur. And then identifying those at risk and making sure that we get them connected well to the resources that they need. Those are the primary goals of effective postvention. Your, you serve as a role model. How you handle the aftermath of a suicide is actually going to model for all the airmen how we move forward in rebuilding the community. So part of the challenge, I think, in suicide, especially in the postvention phase, is that you need to manage your own uh, um, emotions and responses regarding suicide. But we don't ask ourselves these questions very often. We don't ask, who do I think dies or kills him or herself by suicide? What do I believe about suicide? What was I raised to believe about suicide? And I can say this because I've been living in the South now for 15 years, but if you're born and raised in, in the South, and you were taught that a person who dies by suicide will burn in hell, then you have to know that it will affect if you ask questions, what questions you ask, how you ask them, and what you do with the information. So it's very important that you do a self-assessment also so that when you have a colleague who is experiencing a suicide and is rolling through the postvention process, you know how to better support them because you have your own, uh, you've managed your own emotions about suicide itself. So understanding suicide. 
Again, as I mentioned a moment ago, it's very important for us to understand the suicidal mind. I think this is a miss, we, we miss the mark on not helping people understand what gets a person to that point. So let me explain it just a little bit. I know this is a little bit of a busy slide, it's probably one of the busiest I have, but it is in one slide captures the essence of the suicidal mind. So the first thing is that it's primarily a decision made by a person that's experiencing real or perceived pain. Whether it's real pain in that they've lost a limb, they're recovering from some illness or something of that sort, or it's perceived that they're going through a divorce after 15 years and they don't know how they're going to recover from it. That's perceived pain. Now, there are different theories that actually explain suicide, and the theory that we submit to you today is by Thomas Joyner, who's one of the leading suicidologists in the nation right now. And Thomas Joyner um, um, indicates that there are three components that lead a person to think about suicide. The first is that they believe they are of some sort of burden, that their suicidal thinking or that their lives and their circumstances are a burden to that person and to those that love them. And so they feel that they're carrying this burden and they don't want to share it with another person. What that leads to oftentimes is a sense of disconnectedness. Now these are not linear. These things do not actually happen in order. They happen together. So you can actually feel a sense of disconnectedness before you feel a sense of burdensomeness. But when you combine them together is when you have that suicidal thinking that might emerge. So a person that has no authentic connections is a person that's disconnected from their, their spiritual community, their family, their children, their work environment. And the more that they feel disconnected, the more burdened they often feel. The third component that will lead a person to suicide is developing a fearlessness about death. They develop a sense of capacity to die by suicide. There are certain, some professions that have a higher rate for suicide than others. And one of the professions that has a higher rate for suicide are veterinarians. Well, this is because they are at death's door all the time, day in and day out. They are euthanizing animals day in and day out, and so they're right there at death's door experiencing it. They develop an act, they acclimate to the idea of death, and so it might become easier for them. This puts our military members at a bit of a disadvantage because they are taught to lean into the fear and lean into the danger and lean into the death, the possibility that you may be sacrificing your life for your nation. So they're, they're already predisposed to this sense of potential fearlessness about dying, and it's not so far a stretch if they're feeling the other things to actually want to die by suicide. There is something that a person experiences that's suicidal, and it's called psychological pain or psych ache. Have you ever seen a commercial for an antidepressant where a person is like holding their head and they're saying, but it hurts, it hurts? Because when you get to a certain point, when you're thinking about dying by suicide, there's actually a physiological change that occurs in the brain that brings you physical pain. And so that physical pain is also another burden that this person might carry. I also want to draw your attention to the last bullet to remind you that we need to do a paradigm shift in terms of how we're thinking about suicide. Suicide is not attention-seeking. Suicide is help-seeking. This is about a 40-year-old woman who's going through a divorce, perhaps, or losing custody of her children, or a man who's losing custody of the children, going through a bitter battle, not knowing how the, what their circumstances are going to be like after, and is trying to seek help, but doesn't have the voice. What does a two-year-old do when they don't get what they want? They throw a temper tantrum, right? They don't have the vocabulary to even explain what frustration they're experiencing inside of themselves. This is sometimes what happens for teenagers and adults. They don't know how to articulate the psychological pain that they're experiencing, and so it is acted out. But it's a paradigm shift to move our thinking from attention-seeking to help-seeking. If you think about it in terms of the person seeking help, then it's easier to digest and manage your own reactions to it. So I wanted to show you, for those of you a bit more visual, the visual graft of Joyner's theory. I simply want to make this point, that when we get people to, cut, to begin a discussion about their suicidal thinking, when they're experiencing that psychological ache or that disconnectedness, we're more likely to get them to step back from death's door. It's when we are looking at it and coming at it from that sense of fearlessness or the acquired capacity to die by suicide that it gets a little harder 
for us to step them away from that idea of suicide. So your role as chiefs and as spouses is to try and engage people in the discussion when they're just initially feeling disconnected. If we can engage in those discussions at that point, we may not even have to refer someone to mental health. But of course, we know that referring them to mental health is also the, one of the, the, one of the um, most secure ways to help them reduce their suicidal thinking. Now, I was not able to show this slide um, 10 years ago. We, this is an exciting slide to me because we did not have this information 10 or 15 years ago. We didn't know what the components to suicide were. And we, not only do we not know the components, we didn't know what the solutions were. We did not know what the issues were that were leading our airmen to suicide necessarily. And we certainly didn't know what the solutions were. This slide shows you that not only do we know the components, we know what the issues are and we know the answers. The challenge with this slide is that you all are the arrows. How are you actually going to help a person reduce their access to means if we know that having means is a, a, likelihood, a greater likelihood that they're going to potentially die by suicide? If we know, and we do, that relationships are the number one issue facilitating suicide among our airmen, you are the arrow. The, the arrow. How are you going to help that airman strengthen their connections? This is exciting information in terms of understanding suicide, information that we didn't have many years ago, but it's a challenge. It's easy for me to say, you're the arrow between this, the challenge or the issue and the solution, but that's the reality. So I want to get you thinking about what are you going to do in terms of reducing those issues, getting a person who's having legal and administrative issues leading to their suicidal thinking into the education that they need. So let's talk about this thing of post-mention. Following a suicide attempt, I'm going to talk about following a suicide attempt and then an actual suicide and how to recover from it. So the first thing in terms of following a suicide attempt is not to fear the airman or the issue. Now that is also easy for me to say. I've been working and studying suicide for 15 years and there's not a person I've met who's suicidal that I don't feel fear because I realize this is a difference between whether or not they live or they die. So, however, it's very important that as you lead the way, you show the airmen that you're not afraid of it and that this is a reality sometimes for a person and that we will get through it together. There's no stronger message that a chief can send or any senior leader can send than to go into the shop following a person's reintegration and stand beside them. Because of HIPAA, you can't say a whole lot, but you send a message to that unit or that squadron or that shop that this stuff happens and we're going to get through it together. Do you want to set the example for engagement? If the person does go into the hospital, you want to uh, talk with the support staff to determine whether or not you should go and visit the person in the hospital. Now, one thing that many people don't know is that the highest time of risk for a suicidal person after they've attempted suicide is the 90 days following their discharge from hospitals. This is an important message for you to understand because oftentimes what happens is we refer the person to the hospital or we get them admitted into the hospital thinking, okay, they're in a very safe place, and they are. But we only refer people to the hospital to medically stabilize them, not necessarily to reduce their suicidality. However, by medically stabilizing them, they get the medication that they need to become more stable and actually might have the, the, the added energy that they need to follow through with the suicide. So it's very important to understand some research indicates that a person in their first 90 days after their discharge is at a great, a, a more than a 270% greater likelihood to die by suicide. Think about that for a moment. They're at a more potential higher rate to die by suicide after their discharge. And they're coming back to you highly suicidal because the average stay for suicide is about two and a half to three days. And if it's more serious, maybe five, to two, five days to two weeks. But that's actually not common. So it's important to understand that they're coming back and being reintegrated into the units in a highly suicidal state. And so your awareness and intervention in this postvention phase is really critical. You want to make sure that you are discussing alcohol and weapons with that person. You want to make sure that you can explain that you've had the discussion about weapons, uh, weapons reduction. 
This doesn't mean wrestling the gun out of their hand, but it does mean that you're making it very clear and showing them that you're not afraid of the topic, that if they have access to the guns, they're in a greater likelihood again to die by suicide. You want to help them reintegrate with their peers. And you want to ask the question, and never underestimate uh, uh, your, the question when you're asking them, what can I do to be helpful in your recovery process? Ask that question. Because sometimes they don't know, but in asking the question, you begin the dialogue that they need to get help from you to reintegrate better. You also want to be alert for and watch for the contagion effect and look for signs that that suicide attempt may have affected frontline supervisors. Um, I'm, I reflect back on the many stories that I have, and I think about the first airman suicide that I experienced was a tech sergeant who was going through a very, very bitter divorce battle. We were at RAF Mildenhall at the time, and um, it was a young airman that actually came into the hangar and found, the, found his supervisor, because he was, of course, as the younger person charged with going in and very early in the morning making sure that everyone had their coffee. But that was his experience. So it's very important after an attempt to remember the frontline people and the frontline supervisors that will be helping that airman with the reintegration back into their work process. Now, postvention is a little bit different than other types of loss um, in our lives. We can get our heads around cancer, die, someone dying by cancer. Cancer happens. We can get our, our minds around the idea of an accidental death. Accidents happen. But no one is prepared for a suicide. No one wakes up when the wind is blowing from the west on a Wednesday and says, I think that this is the day I might lose my loved one. They might be suspect that something might be going on, but it's a very complicated process. And so, in addition to feeling the normal types of, of grief experiences like denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, they might also experience a myriad of other emotions, which I have up here for you to take a look at. They might experience tremendous guilt. Um, we had, um, and, and guilt not just with suicide, but with other kinds of loss as well. The, the tricky thing about postvention is that you didn't need to know the decedent, the person who died, in order to feel affected by it. What happens when a suicide occurs is it conjures up the grief and loss that people experience from other kinds of losses, like loss of their father, or loss of, loss of a parent, or loss of a sibling, or loss of a child. So they might end up wanting to talk with you, or the first sergeant, about those losses, but it was the suicide loss that actually triggered it. So in addition to feeling guilt and embarrassment, they might feel that sense of isolation. What happens when a person loses a loved one to, to um, cancer in the cul-de-sac? Someone will probably bake a casserole, go to their front door, and offer them their condolences and let them know if they need anything just to, 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 to uh, give them a call. What happens when a person loses someone to suicide is not only do they not get the casserole, but the pit neighbors go out the back door because they don't know how to engage in a conversation with them. This leads to social isolation, and when these emotions are experienced, it, there, is a, 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 there is a chance that it might actually lead that person to suicide. One of the factors, one of the risk factors in suicide is actually losing someone to suicide. That's why this postvention is so important. Because if an airman that was beside, was very good friends in a unit or in a shop with an airman who died by suicide, they might be experiencing their own depression and their tremendous sadness and guilt and isolation. It reminds me of a story. Uh, I responded to a suicide once, uh, and it was in an NDI shop. And it was a smaller shop. There were only about seven people. And so they had their, their benches that they were working on. And I went up to the first person, and I said, how are you, how are you doing since the loss of, of this airman? And she said, I'm not doing so well, ma'am, because he was my benchmate, and I've worked with him for three years, and I'm, I'm you know, f f profoundly sad about this. And I went around and I came, to the last, came up to the last person and I asked him, how are you doing? And he said, I'm pissed. I'm really pissed. He said, because I never liked the guy. I wanted the guy out of the shop. And this is not how I wanted him out of the shop. I wanted him out, but I didn't want him to leave us one man down. And now we have twice the work to take care of. So a wide range of emotions from a person who's experienced this postvention after, um, after an attempt or after a completion. All right. Um, they might have the intrusive thoughts and images, or they might have those changes in social relationships. And so these are the things that I want you to be aware of that a person is experiencing after they've lost someone to suicide. 
This is a glimpse of what that experience is like. We don't often think about fully what the experience of losing someone to suicide is like. Can you imagine driving down the road? This is everyone's worst nightmare. Ring, ring, you pick up your phone. This is um, officer so-and-so. I am at your home. There's been an incident. Please come home as quickly as you can. Of course, you're worried about your loved ones. Um, you know it was your child who's there at that time because it's after school and you're actually driving home to go, go home to your child. So you drive as fast as you can to get home so you can see what's happened. You get to the scene, you get to your house, and all you want to do is run in and take your child in your arms because you know that that, that, because you've been told that your child is dead, and you are told that you cannot enter the house because now it is a crime scene. Can you imagine that experience? We don't think about those things when we think about losing someone to suicide. Um, also, they may be the person that tried to um, perform CPR. Another story I have is, it was a, um, an Air Force member, and it was a guard member, as a matter of fact. He wasn't on guard, on guard duty that weekend, and he was happy to be home. And his phone kept ringing, and he, just, he saw it with the caller was a sister, and he didn't answer it because he didn't want to be bothered. After the fourth time, he went to the phone, he was picking it up, and he said, man, I'm going to give her a piece of my mind. And she was screaming into the phone, get over here, get over here. They lived near each other. He hopped in his truck, he went to the house, he tried to perform CPR, and his brother-in-law died. And he came to me and he said, I'm the reason he died. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, if I had picked up the phone sooner, I may have gotten there sooner. He said, the problem is that I lost my father five months ago, I lost my brother, who was my other best friend, three months ago, and now I've lost my brother-in-law, and I now am thinking about suicide. So you can see the trigger for suicidality is not about a non-resilient person. This person was fairly resilient. This is about life circumstances that happen that put us in a place that we never thought we could be in. So what are some postvention guidelines? What are some things that we need you to consider? What are the things, the actions that you're going to put into place to help rebuild that community after the suicide? And, that, and, for, and I'm sure that there are, there's probably not many of you out there, I'm acutely aware, that haven't experienced suicide in some way. So I do want to mention that after this, we have our contact information on the last slide, which you'll be getting copies of. You are more than welcome to co contact Dr. Mad uh, Lieutenant Colonel Madison or myself if you have any follow-up questions or any reactions to the information. But in terms of actions that you can put into place, you want to be empathic to the survivors. Now, one of the things on emotional intelligence when we give, the, uh, when we give uh, an emotional intelligence uh, survey or questionnaire or assessment instrument to people is that they may not feel that they have a lot of empathy. This is a time where you're going to dig deep and you're going to tap into that empathy because that's what this person needs. It is not the time to debate whether or not suicide is right or wrong. You want to make sure that you're using the decedent's name and not the words he and she. This is a very personal experience to the person who's lost someone to suicide. You want to pay close attention to responders and support staff. And the best way for me to emphasize that is to share this story. Again, I had a suicide, and um, uh, we decided, since it was overseas, to have a memorial service on base at the, at the chapel. So I went to the service, and at that, it was actually my client who had died by suicide. And I always like to caveat this, that since I've been studying and working with suicidal patients for a long, long time, you can imagine that I've had patients who died by suicide, so I'm actually a clinical survivor of suicide. I don't want you to get the impression that most of my clients die by suicide, okay? Um, but this, in this case, it was, happened, did happen to be my client. So I went to the memorial service, and I'm sort of surveying people to make sure that I can take care of people as needed. And I saw a young woman. She could not have been more than 19 or 20 years old. Probably, it was her first term assignment. And I see her off in the corner somewhere. And I went up to her and I said, can you tell me how, how, what brings you here today? How did you know the person who died by suicide? And she said, oh, I didn't. And I said, well, what brings you here today? And she said, I'm the photographer that took pictures of the scene of the crime. And I said, how are you doing since the incident? And she said, I'm not well. I haven't slept since I took the pictures. So it's very critical to remember the first responders, casualty affairs, first res the first responders that are there that might have to do the cleanup. Another story that I have in terms of post mention and you serving and knowing how to watch out for people is there was a suicide and it was on the side of the highway with a gun. And the wife called the chief about four, three days later and said, I need my car back so I can get to where I need to be going. They didn't have a second car. 
And so they actually asked some members in the unit to go out and secure the car, clean the car up, and bring the car back to the spouse. Well, one of, they did what they didn't know, and this, they just couldn't have known this, really, unless he had said something. But one of the young airmen that went with the three pe- uh, as one of the three people actually knew the person. In fact, was on the phone with the person when he actually died by suicide. And he felt so guilty, he wanted to be as involved as possible, so he went along on the cleanup. But afterward, he was not doing so well. So these are circumstances that you tend not to think about, but that I want to encourage you to, to consider in, uh, in postvention guidelines. Be aware of your own reactions to suicide. Again, I bring you back to the earlier slide of managing your own reactions. If you've lost someone to suicide in your own life, this is going to conjure up new things for you, things that haven't been resolved necessarily. I want you to understand what the long-term goals for the survivors are. What are their goals? Because their goals in the long-term survival of this are going to be things that you're going to be helping them with. So you want, they, they need to begin to work on reconciling their anger and their fear. And their anger may actually be with the Air Force. And so you might be taking the brunt of that. But again, it's very important to help them work through this long-term goal. It might be to forgive the decedent and others that are perceived for this, that person's role in their suicide death. You want to help them inc- increase their engagement with social networks to reduce their isolation. These are things that the families might be reaching out to you for. It's not uncommon for a a spouse, after they've lost their airman, to come into the chief's office and engage in a conversation. Are you comfortable having that conversation? What kinds of questions will you ask in that conversation? Or how will you listen in that conversation? They're working on trying to accept the mysteries of the unknown, and your work is to try to help them understand that, recognizing that if this isn't necessarily about a spouse that dies by suicide, this is about, or I'm sorry, an airman that dies by suicide. If it's the airman's spouse or child that dies by suicide, these are their long-term goals. This is what they're going to need assistance with. And you want to help them increase their grieving process with other people that have, like, have similar losses. And so in every state, there's um, an American Foundation for Suicide Prevention chapter. And almost every chapter in each state has survivors of suicide uh, support groups that you might be able to identify locally. You can actually get online, look at that national website, and identify when, where support groups are in your state. What are the long-term goals for leadership? I think Chief Wright talked a little bit about taking care of yourselves, and that's why we wanted to include a slide on taking care of yourself at this time. One of the most important things I can ask a leader, I was at a conference once, and there had been a suicide on a base, and originally there were five people from the base, five leaders from the base that were going to be coming. They sent only one, and I was asked at that, at that conference where I was speaking on suicide to talk with that general. And I came out from where I was speaking, and I asked, you know, I asked some details. We talked about postvention. Have you messaged the right things? Um, what have you done so far? What can you do to help rebuild the community? And then I stopped and I said, now, in the last four minutes that I have with you, the most important thing I can ask you is how are you doing? And he got tears in his eyes, and he said, I am not doing well. I've known this airman for 20 years of my life. This is not the person that I thought would die by suicide. I'm not doing so well. So it's important for your own self-care. You are going to be, dis- you, for those of you who have experienced a suicide, you know that you are discharged to take care of the many, many people in the community. But it is equally important for you to step back and take a look at, again, managing your own reactions and how this is impacting you. You want to make sure that your presence is there and it's useful. You want to make sure that the right leader walks through the um, unit or the squadron at the right time. And sometimes as chiefs, you're the ones that have the unfortunate blessing, if you will, to, make, to tell someone that they're not the ideal person to walk through the, walk through the squadron. So you want to make sure that it's someone that actually understands suicide and is sincere about their, reco- their, their, want, their desire for the recovery of the community. We actually had a death incident, a fatality, this weekend at ACSC. We lost an international officer to a hit and run on the side of a road. 
And it was very interesting to me at 9 o'clock last night, after everything that we were doing to stabilize the faculty, the staff, and the students, I sent the dean a message because I watched him do something that I think he didn't even know he was doing well. He was walking through the halls. We have four long hallways, and he was circulating between all four, all four hallways, just walking back and forth to be, he didn't realize this, his visibility was absolutely critical in the postvention phase. Now, that didn't happen to be a suicide. It was a critical incident, but he did not understand the, 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 uh, the impact that that was having. So visibility of leaders after an incident of suicide is actually very, very important. And then recognize that other members and other people recover in different ways. I remember uh, another incident, again, it was in Europe, when um, we had a series of critical incidents. In, and I'm not lying when I tell you they happened one, uh, three consecutive Wednesdays in a row. One Wednesday, we lost someone to a suicide. The ver and I was working at then, if you remember back, it was the Family Support Center 20-some years ago. So I was working at the Family Support Center. We anticipated, because it was a small community, that people would be coming into the Family Support Center early. So we, were, we had the, uh, the recall roster. We all got in. Remember the old phones? We didn't have texting and everything. And we, got, we all came in an hour early to just open up the doors and be available. No one came in. One week later, on that next Wednesday, we had an accidental death. No, we, again, we did the recall roster. We opened up the doors early thinking, now we've had two sequential deaths. So they're probably going to start coming in. And one week later, we had the death of Di Princess Diana. We were all in shock as well. We didn't think to go in early to open the doors. And by the time I arrived, there was a line of people trying to get into the Family Support Center all the way around the building. That's the kind of strange experience that death and grief conjures up for people. You just don't know what the trigger is going to be. So the long-term goals for leadership are to taper off your increased visibility, get back to mission readiness as you know. Leadership self-care also, engage in and promote your own healthy grieving. Connect with other, other um, colleagues who have lost members to suicide. I, I, in my, I'd like to start a list, actually, I should have started this 10 years ago, of all the things that senior leaders have done that worked well in the, in the wake of a suicide and the things that haven't worked well. Um, and you're actually going to get some information on resources, and I'd like to post it on the new, the new website for the Air Force so that you have some sort of guidance on what have other people's experiences been. But in terms of your own self-care, connecting with someone else who has lost someone to suicide can be one of the best things you can do for yourself. Coordinate with your internal and external resources. Make sure that you know who the best resources are to handle a, cri a critical incident like this. Use this experience as a teachable moment and make sure that you have a postvention plan in place. And I'm actually going to give you a resource that you can use if you pulled out the word um, worker or employee and plugged in the word airman, you'd have actually a pretty solid postvention plan. And you want to make sure that you follow those postvention protocols. So here are some resources for you to be aware of. And again, you're going to get this on your slides. The first three or four are not, they don't have anything to do with the Air Force. But I want to point out that the organization Connect, that is what they specialize in, is postvention work. They will actually bring people out, of course you have to pay them, to come out and do postvention work to help you rebuild the community. Then I want to draw your attention to the last bullet on this slide, which is the new uh, resilience website that I just mentioned. This website has a lot of a, a wide variety of, of uh, resources available for you now. It was just, I think it was just um, uploaded and ready to go in Jan dis early dis late December, early January. And Lieutenant Colonel Madison is going to tell you more about that um, and give you some trend data. But I want you to know that the, what's exciting about that resource and that website is that never before have we had a component of post-mentioned resources available to senior leaders. You will find resources for prevention, intervention, and postvention on, on that website. So it's a very exciting time for the Air Force as we move forward with this whole concept of teaching senior leaders about how to take care of people after a suicide. With that being said, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Lieutenant Colonel Madison, who's going to give you some additional information. Thanks. All right, can we please hear it for Dr. Bar Mary Bartlett and all the work she's been doing? 
Thank you, Dr. Bartlett, and thank you for our continued partnership. And Chief Wright, where's Chief Wright? He left. He's in the back. Oh, he said he was going to watch. I don't know. Maybe not. Um, I wanted to thank Chief Wright for this opportunity to be here with you all today um, as chiefs and very soon to be chiefs and also to your spouses who I'm told are perhaps watching um, this on a live stream. Um, I want to thank you all because your reach and your impact when it comes to the care and feeding of our airmen just grew exponentially and that includes your spouse's influence as well. Suicide is an incredibly complex phenomenon. There is no one single answer on how can we never lose another airman or family member to suicide. If it was simple, we would have solved this years ago. Okay? But it is preventable. But it takes every single one of us. It takes every system that we have. It takes folks in our community to work together to get after never losing another person to suicide. Suicide is our leading cause of death of our airmen. Um, that is a fact. Um, we lost 58 last year, and we lost 101 total force airmen last year to suicide. We lost over 25 family members to suicide. Um, we think that number is higher. We're working on a way to capture that better. And what I really want you all to know, as leaders, as citizens, as parents, it is the second leading cause of death of ages 10 to 34 now in our nation. Ages 10 to 34. So this is something that we all need to collectively get after. And so some of the ways that the Air Force has historically gotten after this um, is we have worked with professionals like Dr. Bartlett to create some tools to help empower and equip our leaders like yourselves um, on how to prevent, how to intervene, and then how to help heal after we have lost an airman um, or a family member to suicide. So we do have some tools um, that we continue to improve. And I want you to know that this has all been done with all of you. It's with our line leaders, our medical leaders, who have unfortunately walked that path of postvention. Every time this happens, we try to learn and do better going forward. In fact, this past year, General Wilson challenged us to develop a system similar to a safety investigation board to look at cases where we have lost an airman to suicide. And so we put this together at the half level. We did it this past June. We not only looked at active duty cases, for the first time at the half level, we looked at guard, reserve, and civilian cases as well. From that, um, I think the most important piece is that we partnered with the decedents unit leaders. We brought them in, and together, we discussed what could the Air Force have done better to prepare you, to help you increase the resilience of your units? What could we have done to help improve our intervention with this particular airman? What could we have done to help you and your unit and the family heal and recover and mitigate some of that risk that we know occurs when we lose a loved one or a friend or a unit member to suicide. From that effort now, we have a new reg. Um, it's 95001, Integrated Resilience. So at the MAGCOM levels now, it is a requirement for you to hold an annual suicide analysis board, is the name that we, we have uh, given to this process. Um, we have uh, standard operating procedures. We're here to help. In fact, right, here, right after this, I'm flying to help the National Guard with theirs. Um, so this will be coming um, to you all, and it is purely a way to improve our prevention efforts. It's to look at gaps and seams, and how can we do better going forward? Does it require legislation? Does it, just, does it require equipping? What does it require? What can we do collectively as a community to never lose another airman to suicide? That's some of the things that we are doing, and just please know that you're, you're going to be a part of that. Um, I mentioned some of these stats um, at the beginning, but I want to share some trends that we're seeing. 
So these are trends from 2018. So just this past calendar year. Okay. Um, this is what it looks like for our total force. This does not include spouses. Okay. We continue to lose more men. In fact, about 93% of our suicide deaths last year were men. Well, in our force, we're about 80% men. So that's an overrepresentation given end strength. Now, we know across our nation, men do have higher rates of suicide deaths. So if you know that, maybe this isn't as surprising. The men are married, 64% that we are losing. It used to be that we had more single airmen that we were losing to suicide. We're seeing a little bit of a shift. They're married. So the legal status is married. It's not legally separated, although some of these were experiencing significant relationship issues and maybe were physically separated, but not legally separated from their spouses. What we're also seeing is there's an age shift. It used to be that we were losing more of our very, very young airmen. It's shifted a little bit. Now it's our 21 to 30 year olds. And along with the age shift is a rank shift. And I really want you to please pay attention to this. E5s and E6s. It's the largest proportion of those that we are losing to suicide. It's our E5s and our E6s. Now I still want you to care about our young airmen who are single living in the dorms. But we also need to collectively think about how are we supporting our E5s and our E6s. There's something more perhaps we need to be doing for sort of what I consider the heart of our force, those frontline, midline, su mid-level supervisors that are out there. AFSCs, this probably looks familiar. Okay. We still have aircraft maintenance. We have our, our security forces. A little new um, to these stats is cyberspace support. And then we have vehicle maintenance. Okay. I want to make a point about aircraft maintenance. Um, they're a large AFSC. Okay, we've got, they, they comprise a large part of our end strength. So what we do is we look at the end strength compared to the percentage of our suicide deaths and we determine is this an overrepresentation or an underrepresentation. Historically, aircraft maintenance has been overrepresented. Even though there's a lot of them, they're still overrepresented in suicide deaths, but something has happened this past year, and I'm working with those, the functional leaders in that community to try to figure out, is there something we can learn? Because they have gone down more than half of suicide deaths. So even though they're still on this list, they're underrepresented given their end strength. They had 19 losses the year before, and they had eight this past year. So we're trying to figure that out, and once, you know, if we, is there something we can glean and pass on to the rest of the force, we will. Um, additionally, um, folks are still dying um, through the use of privately owned firearms. In fact, we have the highest percentage out of the other services. In fact, we had zero issued weapons the previous year were used. They were all privately owned firearms, about 70%, and with the total force, it's like 73%. Okay. And then, um, what were the issues they were dealing with? Okay, we know kind of the biggest one that usually emerges is relationship issues. Is Chief Toberman here in the audience? He, I thought he was earlier. He's the only one, when I asked this question, who doesn't have relationship issues? He's the only one that's ever jumped up and said, I have no, no relationship issues whatsoever. And I said, well, maybe that's because you, you know, I'm gonna call your wife and I'm gonna let her know what you answered, okay? A lot of us do have these challenges. Um, and we're not suicidal, okay? But I'll tell you, a lot of these folks who have died by suicide have multiple of these challenges, not just one. That's why the percentages don't add up. So relationship issues continues to be the most represented. Next, we have legal and administrative issues. You all know this, okay? You know to pay special attention to airmen that are within your scope of responsibility who are in some kind of legal trouble or administrative trouble, okay? They are at higher risk okay, for suicide. And then we have workplace issues. So these are other issues at the workplace that don't rise to the level of administrative or legal actions. 
Then we have this new one that we started assessing. And this foot stomps everything Dr. Bartlett just shared with you about the importance of postvention and the increased risk that we all have when we lose someone to suicide. The fourth most common stressor that those we lost to suicide last year is that they were dealing with the suicide death of a family member or a unit member or a friend. That is the fourth stressor that emerged. Finances, we used to talk about finances, that was way down at the bottom, like 3% were dealing with financial issues. Far more were dealing with the suicide death of a friend or family member. So mitigating risk that we know increases after a suicide death is so important, it is prevention. It is prevention. Here's the thing, though. None of us should ever walk alone if we have lost someone to suicide. Because unfortunately, many of us have walked it. Okay? I've lost a family member. I've lost one of my own troops to suicide. How many of you out there, could you please raise your hand? Who has lost a family member or a unit member, an airman, to suicide? Wow. Look at that. More of us have than have not. So there is no reason for any one of us to walk this alone. No reason whatsoever. Okay? And I want to say, while there is no single solution to suicide, this morning Chief Wright got it as right as right can get. Okay? And I'm not just saying that because I, I have to. All right? It is bold, courageous, and engaging leaders. It is you and it is I. But we are not born knowing how to be bold, courageous, and engaging leaders. So a part of our Air Force level initiatives is to equip you all with what that looks like, to give you some tools to help you live that, behave that way, interact that way with your airmen. So our initiatives are kind of bucketed in four areas. Right? At the top, we have connecting communities. We know that that's a very important part of a resilient community where we can drive down negative outcomes. And this involves our spouses. We have a spouse initiative, and I'm always looking for spouses. That maybe they'll, you know, they'll write down my email and send me a note and let me know they want to be a part of it. How can we engage our family members when it comes to recognizing and then knowing what to do to mitigate suicide risk? Okay, we, we've got some, some modules we're creating and some PSAs and some things coming out to equip our spouses and our family members. We need connected communities. We need protective environments. Protective environments. You all need to know how to have a conversation with someone who's at risk on to how can we safeguard their environment. Do they own a weapon? Can we just safely store it temporarily? Can we, can we get lethal levels of medications out of your home? Because I care about, just like I wouldn't let you drive drunk. Right? Friends don't let friends drive drunk. And you know I care about you if I take your keys. Or like Chief Wright just shared with me earlier, he'll go and he'll, he'll be that DD, he'll come pick up his airman who maybe had too much to drink and doesn't have a ride home because he cares. It's the same thing with safeguarding environments and just taking some lethal means put out of the equation, put them away. We've got to make people safer when we know that they are at risk. Right? Another one is detection. How do we help equip you to truly detect Who's struggling out there? Who's at risk? Because some people are really darn good at hiding it. In fact, it's usually our high performers. So it's usually folks like yourselves, really good at hiding when you're distressed and you're struggling. How can we equip ourselves as leaders to better detect the risks that exist with individuals and within our units? We're getting after that. And equipping is that last one. I wholeheartedly ask you to please go to a new website. It was developed after our suicide analysis board to help equip leaders with tools so you, you, you're not walking alone. Right? We're walking with you. 
please, it's in its infancy, go out to www.resilience.af.mil. It's leadership tools for prevention, for intervention, and postvention. We're going to grow that to include more of a total force application of tools as well as for our spouses. So we're going to grow it. It's brand new. Please go check it out and give us feedback. We know it can be better. We know it's maybe missing some things. We need to tweak some things. Please partner with us because we want to partner with you to get after never losing another airman or family member to suicide. So with that, um, I'm going to bring Dr. <laughs> Dr. Bartlett back out, and we have about, about 15 minutes for questions. Now, one of the things I've learned whenever I present, co-present with Lieutenant Colonel Madison is that most of the questions are directed at her. So um, because I am a therapist, I'm not afraid of feelings and things of that sort. So if you have any process-oriented uh, questions or concerns related to suicide, I'm your, I'm your person. Yes, please. Good morning. Uh, Chief Guzman, headquarters, USAFF Africa. Just had a quick question about the new AFI the 95001. Chapter 5 mentions a <coughs> checklist or a protocol for first sergeants and commanders to follow for folks under investigation. Can you uh, elaborate on that some more? Is that checklist available yet? So first of all, you just made my day because you actually read the new instruction. So that's <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. So um, if, if any of you have been in the business of, of kind of trying to write uh, instructions lately, um, number one, we got rid of three AFIs to put it into one because we're supposed to reduce AFIs. Number two, they have to be succinct. Number three, they don't want you to put um, attachments in it. So in the old suicide prevention AFI, we used to have these checklists as attachments. Now you will find them on www.resilience.af.mil. So Chief, check it out and M-A-T-T-E-S-O-N, email me. Oh, right. Uh, do we do we need to Alicia. change it up, make it better? Okay, yes. Move to the next slide. Oh, there go. oh, oh, yeah. Here and here's our email. <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. And again, thanks for reading it. Good morning, Senior Master Sergeant Kevin Hammer, uh, Joint Base McGuire Dix Lakehurst EOD Flight Chief. First of all, this is uh, exceptionally frustrating information to hear, and uh, partially because we had a suicide in our unit. Uh, about two and a half years ago. And uh, when we approached our mental health folks about what do we do about postvention, they had no clue. Um, they came in and they gave us a, uh, a CBT on suicide prevention. So we were kind of left to our own devices in, in how to care for our own airmen. Uh, and it wasn't just the fact that he, uh, he committed suicide, uh, it was that there was two prior attempts and there was no training uh, given to our folks on on how to reintegrate him or how to help him. Yeah. It was a, uh, after he had went through inpatient, he was delivered back to our unit and it was your problem, um, which ultimately resulted in him committing suicide. So I'm not sure about everybody else in this room, but this is the first time I've heard this information on a postvention program for the Air Force and I've been asking for years. So it's good to see that the initiative is in the works. So. What are we doing to pass this information down to who I would consider the subject matter experts or our mental health folks? That's a great question, and I'm so sorry that we weren't where we are today two and a half years ago. Um, so, so I uh, kind of represent a bridge. Um, the suicide prevention program, um, when I came on board two summers ago, it was still over in the SG, and that's where it had been since it stood up in the 90s. Um, we took that program, brought it over to the Pentagon, to the half. We are now integrated with what used to just be CVS, uh, sexual assault. Okay? It's now sexual assault, sexual harassment. We brought the resilience program in and then suicide prevention. And we work um, for the line. So my director is, is General Martin and my SEA is, is Chief Barbie. So that was a really important move in my humble opinion because it's where it should be, okay? It is not just like a, a mental health phenomenon, although mental health is incredibly important um, in the cycle of preventing suicide, but it's really being led by the line. And so it has allowed for many more conversations 
um, to talk about the misses in the past and how do we get better, how do we strengthen um, the, the delivery of prevention to our airmen to include how do we take care of our airmen who have had a non-lethal suicide attempt, who perhaps have been impatient. How do we take care of them coming out? Dr. Bartlett was spot on when we know that that is the time of highest risk is when someone comes out. And so how are we working with and partnering with our leaders um, who then, so, so let me just really quickly, okay? We're working it from both sides. We're working to improve the communication that must take place between mental health and our, our unit leaders. Again, working it from both sides. One of the things that we're doing is we're writing standard operating procedures that require line leadership, unit leadership, to be present before discharge when the safety planning is taking place for the individual who's going to be discharged. So you will be at the seat, you will be at the facility, you will know every part of that safety plan for the airman who's gonna come out of the hospital. Because we know that that was a big um, gap in communication. That came out loud and clear when we did the suicide analysis board. And let me also add um, that I agree, first of all, I'm sorry for that loss and I share your frustration. I've been foot stomping postvention for the Air Force for about 10 years. And um, I am very pleased at the progress that we're making now, even though we, we were slow to get there. Chief Wright has done a fantastic job, and Lieutenant Colonel Madison, I can honestly tell you that in her, since she's taken uh, her role in this position, has moved postvention forward further than I ever thought we could get in my lifetime. So I'm very pleased about that. But I think that it's not just about educating the mental health providers, which is a key element, but it's also about training our key leadership like you. And so to that end, I've been teaching postvention uh, uh, resources and strategies to our leadership here across Air University as well as across other major commands. So I actually teach um, all the elements of postvention at the First Sergeant's Academy, at the, chief, the regular chief's course, um, uh, OTS, ACSC, Air War College, uh, many of the colleges here. But when I get a special request, uh, an invitation, to go and speak somewhere else. I generally, it's shifted now. 10 years ago, my invitations were on prevention and intervention. Now they're on postvention. So we're seeing a shift in the leadership, knowing that this is an important issue and topic and bringing us in to do more of the lectures just for this, the, the frontline supervisors as well who need to be equally equipped in it. Just one, one more quick thing. With, with, the, um, with the creation of A1Z, Integrated Resilience, there's now a capability that was rolled out to each of your installations and at the MAGCOM levels, and that's your violence prevention integrators. It's a new capability, and we are working on how we train and equip them as well. But their job is primary prevention, really of all these negative outcomes. Um, and so that's something else that the Air Force has done to try to increase the capacity. Other questions? I'm sorry, I don't know if we go back and forth or you put your hand up first in the back, so. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Uh, Senior Master Sergeant David, 86 Airlift Wing, Ramstein. So I was checking out the demographics that you had on the screen and I was curious what research you guys have done into folks with combat experience, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, and the reintegration efforts. That's a great question. So we've looked at it and looked at it and looked at it, and the DOD has done a tremendous amount to look at like, the effect of deployments. Um, and I'll, quite frankly, it's because Congress is asking, right? Media is asking, America is asking, we're asking. Um, is there a link? So this is what I will tell you about mental health and those that we have lost to suicide. About half have known mental health um, conditions. Now I say known because perhaps more had mental health um, challenges, but we just didn't officially know about it yet. Um, for um, depression, that tends to be the highest kind of diagnosis. Folks that are dealing with depression, um, if untreated, can get into a suicidal realm, a very dangerous realm. About 12% of those that we lost to suicide the previous year um, had known depression. Um, diagnoses. About 8% had known PTSD diagnoses. So about 8%. 
had formal diagnoses of PTSD. When we look at deployments, about half have had one deployment, and maybe uh, I think it was about 9% had more than one deployment. So is it a factor? Are we looking at it? We're looking at it. It seems to be a small factor um, that we see. And for reintegration, I think the reintegration efforts, um, again, it's wonderful to be at the half um, with A1Z because we are working collaboratively with other agencies that have parts and, and pieces of the reintegration efforts. Um, we are working with the Wounded Warrior Program, Invisible Wounds of War. Actually, I think you have a briefing, the Wounded Warrior Program here coming up next. Um, we're working collaboratively together to look at how can we improve existing reintegration um, efforts. I will tell you a theme that comes out when we look at mental health and suicide, and I need your help, each and every one of you with this. Everything we say and do needs to contribute to a culture that supports early help seeking. Early help seeking. The earlier we can get people into the help that they need, the better the outcome. It's never too late, but when something has gone on, whether it's PTSD or depression, it does get more difficult to turn around. It's not impossible, but it's more difficult. So we are trying to make sure that message is incorporated through all of our reintegration efforts. So it's a great question. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I was, I, you're all it's shadowed, so I don't know who was up there first. Ma'am, uh, Chief Spitzka, I'm at the Pentagon as well. Um, earlier you said, you know, our, um, our numbers are increasing this year. I know that the American average is also increasing. Um, but you also said, I think it was 270% greater chance um, of dying from suicide when, when uh, coming out of a suicide attempt, coming back to the unit. Uh, and then you said it was like a, an average of a three-day Oh, sit right. in the hospital. Yeah. Why? Why is it only a three-day sit then? I mean, is there information showing it doesn't really matter? You're just delaying it anyway? Mm, well, um, there are a lot of fact. Thank you for that question. Um, there are a lot of factors. The reason that a hospital stay for a suicidal person is on an average two and a half to three days is largely due to insurance purposes that there's the, the, the need and there aren't enough beds for, there aren't enough psychiatric beds for patients to come in. And so they're trying to get people out medically stabilized as quickly as they can and then out again. And that's why we wanted to make sure that we brought you that information so that you understand their suicidality is typically not being worked on to any great, to any great length um, while they're in the hospital. And that's why they're coming back to you. We need you to know they're coming back to you highly suicidal. So the reasons that they're not allowed to stay longer typically have to do with insurance purposes um, or the fact that the client is indicating within that three days that they are no longer suicidal. Once a client indicates that they're not suicidal, they will not harm themselves, they will not kill themselves, they have no intention of killing themselves, they are then released. Well, I'd add, if, uh, I've heard the, uh, the Air Force, you know, the goal of you know, zero suicides for, I don't know, at least eight years now or so. Um, we're not there, obviously. So if it's an insurance thing, I mean, we've, we've got the insurance to cover Here's, it here's a complicating factor. Um, legal rights. So I, with, with us in TRICARE, I think maybe for our population, maybe the insurance is, is not as much of a factor as it is in the civilian sector. For us, it's more how long can we hold somebody against their will. And we have legal limitations. Um, and what Dr. Bartlett explained, if people are saying that they're not in imminent danger of harming themselves, um, then they're going to be ready to be released, which is why we know that it's so important that you insist and you are at the table for the safety planning for that individual. And if that individual has a spouse that is, um, and it's, it's a relationship that is supportive, the spouse needs to be there needs to know what that safety plan is, or if there's a roommate, whoever this person is going to be going and staying with, they need to know what that safety plan is. Because here's the thing, you go to an inpatient psychiatric unit, you get stabilized, you're released, your work has just begun. The work has just begun. 
for those individuals. And that's why they are still at risk. And I know it's frustrating. I've been on both sides of this equation. Like I, I shared with you, I've lost one of my own staff sergeants to suicide. And it was after he was released from an inpatient stay. So I've been on both sides. I've been a provider and I've been on in a leadership position on this, on this issue. When somebody comes out of a hospital, they have a lot of work that they still need to do to really get to a healthy place. And I'd like to just also add to that, that their likelihood for suicide research shows does go down month by month, but the challenge is that it's still likely over 100% even after 12 months. So that whole first year that they're back at, at your unit is a time for eyes on. You know, not that you're gonna treat them with kid gloves. You still have to do mission first, but to be thoughtful of the challenges and the work that they're gonna need to do over the course of the next year and sometimes two years. We are out of time, and uh, so I thank you for these wonderful questions and your engagement. Um, our contact information is provided, and we hope that we will hear from you. Again, uh, any questions that you have, if I don't have the answer and you contact me, I will make sure that I get you the information. I want to thank you for the work that you're doing and congratulate you for the positions that you're in now. Um, really, it's humbling for both of us to be able to provide this information to you. On this new concept, for many of you, the concept of postvention was new. We were grateful to have the chance to bring it to you. Thank you very much. You. All right, just a couple of quick, quick announcements before break. Would all AFSOC personnel come up to the front, my left, uh, at the beginning of this break? And would uh, all the Air Force Reserve please come up to the right? at this break. Please be back in your seats at 1025.